Hello everyone, this is Melanie from Melanie B's Creative Studio. And today I'm going to talk to you about what to do if you have never painted anything in your life, except maybe a room. So art painting is completely different than any other kind of painting. And paint by number painting is different than most other types of acrylic painting. So I'm gonna to try to answer a lot of your questions this morning about simple, um, basic techniques, tips, tools, things like that, okay? It's not only for a non-artist, but in addition, it can help some of you who have just gotten started with Paint by Number and you may, may have some of those basic questions. So the first question I get quite a bit is, why do I need a tutorial for Paint by Number? Isn't it self-explanatory? Yes and no. So the way I wanna answer that question is, when you have a Paint by Number, the paints are different than normal acrylic paints. So a paint by number, the purpose of it for me is for me not to have to be creative. I do not have to start with a blank canvas. I'm not intimidated. I'm not worried that whatever I spend time on is gonna turn out horribly or, you know, that kind of thing. So a paint by number tutorial, what that's gonna allow you to do is make the most out of your paint by number. So I'm not gonna get into all of the tips and techniques and the newbies, you know, guide. I have those two videos already. But the first question I'm always asked is, why do I need a tutorial for Paint by Number? So I wanted to make sure I address that with you guys. The surface of the canvas needs a, a different kind of prep than a normal canvas would. The um, paints are handled a little differently than a normal paint would be dealt with. So that is why I do these tips and techniques in all of these videos. So currently, at the time of the recording of this particular video, I have over 50 paint by number videos. So apparently, there are a lot of questions and a lot of things that you can learn that will help you with your new hobby, which will soon become your new obsession and addiction. I'm just gonna put it out there, that is my disclaimer. Beware addictive hobby warning okay <laughs> everybody that i know that's ever done a paint by number is just like oh my goodness why didn't i do this sooner let's talk about our next question now we need to talk about how much water needs to be in your rinsing cup before you start so i'm gonna get the amount of water that I need in this beautiful little flower pot looking collapsible water dish, which I absolutely love. Uh, I was sent a blue one recently by a viewer and I immediately went and bought the lime one as well. I have the blue one with water in it right now and I'm gonna go put some water in this to show you how much you need to get started. Now this is not a lot of water. When you only have this much water, you're going to be you know, pouring it out often as soon as it starts getting really cloudy, whenever you're not able to rinse your brush and see that it's clean, then you'll want to change out your water. But the reason we don't use a lot of water is because our brushes, are our tool, our number one tool for applying our paint to our surface. So we don't want water to get up into this area this is the ferrule of the paintbrush, and then this is wood in most cases. So in this situation, I do not want my paintbrush going down here and being that ferrule, where the ferrule meets the wood, under the level of the water. So the reason that is an issue or can become an issue is that a lot of times the paintbrushes are not just cramped but they're also glued. So the more water you apply to the glue over time, the more it softens. And then what happens is you get a jiggly ferrule and an inconsistent paint job, pretty much. So we only get enough water to put it down to where it does not, let me put it this way so you can see better. So it does not cover the ferrule. So I can swish it around. Then what I'm gonna do, I'm never gonna take it out of the pot with all this water on it. I'm just gonna kind of tap it on the side 
And then for me, this is an optional thing, is I like to use a cosmetic wipe. And the reason I use a cosmetic wipe and not a baby wipe is there is a special ingredient. I do not know which what ingredient it is, but they will condition our brushes and keep them in, in point like this while we work. So when you rinse your brush, and I'm gonna show you that in a minute, actual rinsing, but let's say I go ahead and I'm rinsing my brush here and I knock off some of this excess and then I bring it to my cosmetic wipe and I am pulling it and I'm reshaping my bristles so that I have a beautiful point. Now what this also does is it removes any water that might be on the ferrule that could drip onto your painting and dilute your paint. So that is why you're gonna use something to kind of pull the uh, water off and make sure there's no paint left in the brush and that is what I use. Now, everything I'm gonna be talking about today will not only be in the description below, but it will also be at my blog, which you can find right here. And there is an entire uh, post with all of the tools that I love, all of the links for the tools that I love. And so you can print that list if you would like, or you can just have it as a reference. Let's say I'm about to start a new painting. I have opened up a new brush. Before I ever put my brush into a paint pot, I'm going to rinse it off first. When they manufacture brushes, the way they keep the brush tip in the proper position is they will dip it in a residue, a sometimes egg white, sometimes they use a conditioner, and whatever it is different companies use, that is going to leave your brush bristles very stiff. So you wanna make sure that you, you kind of rinse your brush, make sure it's not stiff and it's very pliable before you ever dip it into your paint. All right, so before you ever ask me, what brushes do I need? That is also in many, many, many of my videos. As I have been painting and as I have been recording videos for you guys, I have found new and better brushes or at least more, not maybe not better brushes, but I have found more affordable brushes and that kind of thing. So I'm not gonna go through today on a whole list of brushes that you need. If you do not have the budget to purchase other brushes, use what comes in your kit for now, but be sure to watch my newbies video for paint by number. And it will tell you how to prep those brushes and how to use those brushes to get the most out of them. Okay, so let us move on to this question. So a question that a lot of people will ask is, where do I start on my new painting? Here is my advice to you. Everything I'm gonna tell you today is just my advice. It's just how I do it. There is no rule. Let me just put that first. There is no rule to how you should approach your painting. But the easiest thing for me, because I am a right-handed person, I'm gonna work left to right, but I will also, I will work Actually, top to bottom. I, I'm gonna just kind of show you, and I will be painting here in a minute, but I wanted to kind of show you what I mean. So here I have a left, I can go left to right. And then here, when I get to this point, this is also the same number, number 10. So I can stop about right here, do this part of my number 10, and then come back and finish this part. The reason I do that is so my arm is not moving. My hand isn't moving into wet paint. If you are a lefty, you will start from the right side and work to the left. That is just because you don't want your hand in the paint. And it's, it gets a little tedious, I'm not gonna lie. If you have to keep your hand up in the air like this to paint because you know it's wet over here, then that will that is a really quick way to learn why that technique doesn't work super well. <laughs> so another question I get is, do I start with black? Do I start with white? What color do I start with? All right, so here is my personal preference. I tend to work on sections. So let me put it this way. If I wanna work on this seagull and this rock formation right here, 
and there's black in this. I'm gonna do black first because acrylic paint covers acrylic paint so beautifully after it dries that if I go over the line a little bit with my black, then when I come back in with another color, it will cover that little bit of black that I might've gone over the line. So when that happens, it is easier to cover the little bit of black over the line with a color than it is to cover a color with black. Because let's put it this way, if I do this beautiful pale color and I come back in here and I'm doing my black and I go over the line, guess what? I'm pulling out this light color and I'm gonna be going over it because the black went over into the light color. I hope that makes sense. Gosh, that really didn't sound, I don't know if that made sense or not. The other thing I never ever do, if any of my paints are white, let's just say I'm gonna pull this one out, a number six. Number six will be my last paint that I put on this for this reason. If I paint number six and it's white, and later I'm using a, a color that is a little bit see-through, and I have to paint that number, that cell. Let's say number one is a transparent color, which sometimes you'll get. Color that is pretty see-through and you have to do a lot of coats or you'll have to put white down first. So let's just say I have this number one and it is a transparent paint. What I do is I have to go over it and put a nice white opaque paint down, which I will talk to you about in my other two videos that I mentioned. But what happens is, how do I know the difference between this number one that is a transparent paint and that I put white down and a number six that is a white to begin with? So again, that might sound a little confusing, but do your white last. That way you don't get confused with the whites that you're using to paint transparent paint over the top. That'll make more sense if you watch those other two videos too. So let's talk about the paint. The paints are the guts of your entire piece. So the two things you need to paint this, besides a paintbrush, is gonna be your canvas and your paint. This is a very frequently asked question. There's several very frequently asked questions regarding paint. So what I wanna show you for those people who've never painted, we're gonna talk about how far we dip our brush into our paint pot. I'm gonna do this section right here. Now this section's number is number 10. All of this is number 10. Sometimes they're difficult to open, but let me tell you, when you open your paint pot, you wanna be very careful. I don't usually open it over my canvas. I will do it for the video. So the consistency of the paint, which means what it should look like, how thick it is, is way different than other paints. This is the consistency you want. It's not dripping, but it is creamy. Someone on my group said it is like melted ice cream. And I said, oh my goodness, yes, that's exactly right. So your paints don't normally come like this. They are usually a lot thicker. And what I have done is I've added one or two drops of straight Flo-Aid. Now there's this big question about whether the Flo-Aid needs to be diluted or not. It says on the bottle to dilute it, but it's also referring to normal acrylic paints in a tube that are thick. These are thin. They do not need more water. So 90% of the time, if I'm ever going to get my paint to the right consistency, I'm only going to add one or two drops of Flo-Aid. So what I want to show you here is this is how your paints will look when you first get them. They're creamy, right? But they're thicker. And this is a beautiful consistency for paint. Anna Banana is the piece that I'm working on. Um, and it's Anna Petanova. It's one of her art pieces that they are licensed to sell. And, um, but their paints are amazing. But even though they are super creamy, they still sometimes require a drop of flow aid to help them move on the canvas. Now, if you get too much flow aid, what it'll do is it will dilute it too much to where you might have to do two or three layers. Most of the time, if you get just enough flow aid, you will 
not have to recover that same place over and over and over again and get really good coverage. So this is what a normal paint pot looks like. I'm gonna take my Floyd bottle and I have a dropper. It's like an essential oil dropper. I will be, it's, called, it's a pipette. I'm actually gonna be selling these in my site soon just so you guys can kind of get all your little extras there if you need to and I'll be adding that onto future videos once it's here. But anyway, then I'm gonna take something like a stir stick. This is a great little tool, little metal tool. It's got a spoon on the end, like a scoop, and then it's flat on the other end. And I can actually take this and stir that in. So when I stir it in, I'm bringing it up from the bottom and I'm gonna stir it, making sure that it is all mixed in really perfectly. Now this one is not as thin as the blue one I showed you first. What I would do is I would paint with this, see what I think of the consistency and the coverage, and then I would add another drop if I needed to. But you see how creamy it is? So it is creamy, but it's not dripping. You see that? All right. You want to make sure you are closing your paint pots always. Now, when I'm working on this color, I will have it open and I will be painting and it will stay open for a little while. So I have to be sure to close it. When I close my paint pot, I want to make sure that I am closing it, that it clicks twice. Like that was two clicks real close together. That way there's no air getting into my paint pot while it's being stored. Okay. So let me move this aside for a minute. Now, another thing I want to mention was why the paint pot will glue shut sometimes. You never, ever want to take your paintbrush and get paint on it and then wipe it off on the side. Now, if you're going to do it, you need to wipe it where it's kind of up and down like this. If paint gets around the edge, when it dries, it will glue your paint pot shut. So never wipe your paintbrush on the side of your paint pot. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this clean paintbrush and I'm going to kind of take it through that little rim and get off any paint that's in there. And I wanna make sure that I have any paint out of that little rim so that when it closes, it will not glue that shut. Now, if dried paint is on the rim, all you have to do is once it's dried, you can peel it off, throw it away. But be sure that you have cleaned out that little rim if you've got a lot of paint in there for some reason. So I am using a brush that is pointed. What this one is, is a size three round. This one is good for larger openings. So there are several brushes that will come with your kit. The flat brush you'll use for kind of the big openings here, and then you can take a pointed round brush like this one, and you can use it to do the edges and the detail work around the edges, which we'll talk about in other videos. But what I wanna show you is how far your brush needs to go down into your paint how much you need to get on it, and what part of the paintbrush are you gonna be painting with. Now I wanna to try to get my light just right here. It's a very overcast day, so I'm getting a lot of crazy shadows. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm taking my brush, and when I dip it in, I'm going about halfway. So the reason I'm going halfway is because you do not want paint to get up into the ferrule. Once paint dries up in this ferrule, then it will fray your brushes. A lot of the times the reason your brush is fraying is because you're getting paint up in this section. So this is something you want to avoid by only dipping your paintbrush halfway into the paint. Now, depending on the opening that I'm painting will kind of determine how much I get. This is something that once you start painting, you will get your own feel for, but for me, if I have a large opening, I can technically go in and get a little bit more than that, but I'm not getting a lot, okay? So I'm gonna lay down all that thick paint that I just got on there somewhere away from the edge, 
then I will use it kind of like a palette and I will pick it up and get up close to my edges like this. So it is not gonna be thick. Sorry, I just went over the line. Um, it won't be thick around the edges if you do not put all that paint at the edge. If you put it in the center and then you kind of pull from the center towards the edges, you'll realize real fast that you don't get those weird ledges up against the line. So another thing people ask is what, you know, how do I work with the brush? What side do I use? Well, with a round brush, all sides are the same, but because this is larger, when I push it down, it kind of becomes a rectangular point. Let me see if I can show you right there. See how it's kind of flat at the tip? So I will just use what is on that side of the brush and then I will rotate my brush and I will use what's on the other side. And I kind of work it back and forth until all that paint is gone. Now you can dip directly back into the pot without rinsing this off. And we're just gonna do a little bit of painting. If you feel like your paint has stopped moving on the canvas, which just means it's easy to, you know, to brush, to be smooth, then you want to rinse your brush and come back into your paint. I don't have to rinse my brush very often during a, just doing a certain color. A lot of times I will keep working and I work kind of fast so my paint isn't drying out on my brush. But if your paint ever looks like it's drying out on your brush, you wanna immediately rinse it. Now, let me show you something. If you get too much, let's say you get too much paint on your brush. Now I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna rinse this brush and I'm gonna show you how to do this in just a minute. But for right now, I'm going to show you with a flat brush like this one. This is kind of like one that comes with your kit. Um, but let's say I get too much on my brush. Let's say I come down here and I have a small opening and I end up with a big blob of paint like this. You can, turn your brush upward a little bit and kind of pull and drop it off on the edge without coming down and doing it like this. You see, when I do it like this, the paint gets on the edge and that causes problems. But let's say I have this flat brush and I have a whole lot of paint on there. If it's a large opening, I can just use what I got. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna put it in the center and then I'm gonna work from the center and smooth out all of that excess paint and just smooth it, moving it as far out as I can. Now I use, on a flat brush, I'm gonna use one side and then I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna use the other side. All right, I'm gonna stop for that, stop with that for just a second. Now let's talk about rinsing. Now you can see just a little bit of time I've been working, I already have, you know, cloudy water. But I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna rinse my brush. So when you rinse your brush, most of the time I use something called a paint puck. It's this little suction cup thing tool that goes in the bottom of my paint cup and it allows me to move it back and forth on my paint puck and it gets all the acrylic paint out of the inside of my bristles. So let me clear this water up real quick and I'm gonna show you what a paint puck is and how it works in case you do decide you want to get that. I have fresh water and I have this little thing and it has a suction cup on the bottom and it's got all these little nodules on the top. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push it down into my cup to make it suction cup on the bottom. Usually what I do is I will use the back end of a plastic paintbrush and kind of push it down in there now what I do is I, if I have paint on my brush, I'm gonna pull it across these little bristles. And what it does is it separates the bristles and helps the paint come out from in between. Now, I, I know a lot of people are gonna say, now is this a tools video or is this a paint by number or a new painter video? Let me explain something about that. Tools are part of this hobby. So if you can use a tool that is gonna help you in the long run, then I'm gonna tell you about it. If you don't have to have any of these things, you can just use a solo cup for your water, but you definitely want um, to have probably at least good brushes, clear gesso and flow aid, which you're gonna see in my other videos. I use it all the time. 
But as far as these extra tools, they just make life easier. So if you decide you're gonna get really big into this hobby and you want to do it right and make it as easy as possible, then these are the things that I recommend for you. Another question I get a lot is that they'll say, Melanie, you say that I need to get a painting with wide open spaces if I'm a beginner. What does that mean? Well, this painting, as far as I'm concerned, is great for a beginner. And I'm gonna show you why. So you can see the top has a lot of wide openings. There's not a ton of little tiny spaces. There's a lot of nice open spaces. And so I, I believe this is the perfect type of beginner painting. Now, a lot of people will buy the rainbow kind of animal paintings. Um, you've probably seen those with the black background or a white background and it's very rainbow, colorful, nice open spaces. There's not a lot of detail. That is the kind of beginner painting you may wanna start with. You might look at this one and think, oh my word, I can't do that. This is how I'm gonna tell you. This is my advice to you. When you get a paint by number, and if it has a bunch of little openings that you are completely unsure how to approach, look at it like this. Take one cell at a time. Don't look at things like this shell that might have a lot of simple spaces. Look at it like, here, I'm gonna approach number one. I'm gonna approach number one here. And I'm gonna approach number one and number one. And if you break it down into you know one cell at a time mentality, it is not as overwhelming. I was a food service manager at Clemson University. And you talk about dealing with 8,000 people a day. So you can be overwhelmed very easily in that kind of situation. We had a Panda Express that opened up and was brand new in one of the food courts that I was manager of. And I was in charge of the Panda Express restaurant because it was new and they knew I knew it in and out, inside and out, and I was really great with customers, which made me feel super good. But what I had to tell my employees, because they would freak out, they would look up and the line had 200 people in it and they would start to panic and get frustrated. So my advice to them would be, you focus on the customer in front of you. Don't look past that customer. You give them your 100% attention you give them what they need and you do it with a smile and then you thank them. And the people who have waited in line are not gonna be angry if they see that you are handling the situation like that. So that is how I do this type of painting or the ones that I get from other companies that have super detail like grass blades and um, trees and leaves and things like that that have tiny little openings. Super detailed paintings are going to be little tiny openings. So those are ones that you may want to avoid at first just to not feel overwhelmed. But anyway, that analogy, I kind of just use that to approach everything in life. Focus on the thing in front of you instead of everything around it and not to be too overwhelmed by it. All right, so that is gonna be it for today, you guys. I know you guys are gonna have more questions and uh, need more answers, but here's what I'm going to do. I wanna invite you to my new Patreon, Creator Studio. And what Patreon is, is it is, a way, it is a way to help me out a little bit financially um, for the videos that I bring to you. But most of all, it is so that I can build a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the people who are my top fans or um, my top viewers or the ones you know that really want some personal attention. There are three different packages that you can sign up for. You are able to cancel that at any time. You are not stuck in some, you know, recurring monthly payment plan that you can't get out of. It is totally an optional thing. Different packages that I have offered will have different perks. The largest package is going to include everything that's in the first and second package. So you will get a lot of different things. I have broken down those packages on my website for you to read and kind of look over and decide if you think it's something you want to do. And from my website, you can take the link if you would like to join and go straight to Patreon and you can sign up there. But it is a great way for me to get 
a personal connection with you, for me to do question and answers with you, um, for me to communicate with you in a priority type of situation. And my $20 package a month will include question and answer live streams and some exclusive things that nobody else is going to give you. All right, so be sure to head over there. Make sure you look at this link right here. This is where you're going to find the information. And the down here is where you can just go straight to Patreon and join if you would like to. All right, you guys, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And I will see you back soon with lots more tips for Paint My Number. Thanks as always for watching. See you soon.